Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I always learn so much from Rosalie's children's talks, you know. In fact, they are the highlight of the service, really. Do you know, for years, my mother, if I had a splinter, would get a big needle and she'd heat it up over a candle and she would dig it out like this. I wish you were my mother. <laughs> How I would have loved to have had a splinter and just stick it in some warm water so it comes out. Yes, I was abused. No, I wasn't abused by as a child, it's not true. But it's interesting because my dad used to like salt. And salt, sugar's no good, right? Everywhere you go, can't have salt, can't have sugar. The white stuff's no good for you anymore. And we know that too much salt is bad for you. And my dad did an interesting thing. He liked tomato sandwiches. Well, who doesn't like tomato sandwiches? But he used to say, listen, boy, if the tomato doesn't have much flavour, you have to stick a bit of salt on it. Well, when he means a bit of salt, he'd get the shaker and it'd be all, it looked like dandruff all over the thing after he'd had a had a shot, it was everywhere. But it's true, just like Rosalie said, if we put salt on something, what is unique and flavoursome comes out. My dad used to like um, prawns. I guess most people like prawns. I don't care for them myself, but dad loved prawns. And he used to say, oh, we can't afford to have the big prawns. So he used to eat the little baby prawns. And he'd come home and he'd say, righto, we're going to have a prawn sandwich on a nice piece of bread. So he'd get the piece of bread and he'd put the butter on it and he'd put the prawns on it. And then he'd get the salt. He said, because they're little tiny ones, not much flavour in them. But if we stick plenty of salt on them, there we go. <laughs> if we stick plenty of salt on them, the flavour's going to come out. Well, I didn't like prawns, so I used to put just a few on there, didn't put any salt on them, put another piece of bread and I could hardly taste it. It was a good thing. Here, Jesus is telling us as disciples, we've got one of two ways to go. We can be salty, the things that make us followers of Jesus can come out, or we can be like the little tiny school prawns that are not salted. You can stick them in your mouth and they taste like nothing. And the reason that Jesus is calling us to be salted is because he gives us things. As followers, we are recipients of his grace. We are recipients of his love. And when we open ourselves and we are willing to be salted, other people can see the goodness of God. Other people can see the grace of God. And this is a pretty obvious thing in this scripture. But to really understand it, we have to sort of get what was happening in the first century. You see how Rosalie said that there are like five or six different salt containers. You know, in the first century, no salt containers. Salt came in blocks. They used to be uh, the salt mines and Israel had lots of salt mines. In fact, one of the reasons that the, um, the kingdom of Israel was wealthy is because they had salt abundantly. Well, they were right near the Dead Sea. They had lots of salt. And they traded salt. Salt was a valuable commodity, as Rosalie said before. Preserving, enhancing flavor. And Israel made money out of its salt. And if you wanted salt... You went down to the, the mountain and you cut a chunk out. But you can't just get the pure salt on the top. There's the salt on the top and then the further you go down, there's dirt and there's rocks because you're pulling it out of the side of a mountain. So you'd sit down and you'd put your salt in your house and if you needed some salt, you'd scrape it off and you would use it. But then when you got to the bottom... There was salt, but there was dirt and there was rocks. And this is what Jesus was talking about. When the salt loses its saltiness, so if you went to your block and you tried to scrape some more off, and there's no salt, all you're getting is dirt and rocks, a little bit of salt, then you take this. And what they did typically was to throw it down on the footpath because the little bit of salt that was there would kill the weeds. And then it would be trampled underfoot. So 
So for us, it's helpful to know the context of what was going on here. And Jesus was also calling on um, an idea from the Old Testament, was that salt creates a bond. It not only brings things out, but it creates a bond. Let's say I was going to go and do a deal. I had agreed that I'm going to buy this cart or this donkey or whatever. Or I was going to go into a business arrangement with somebody. We would sit down and we'd share a meal. A meal was all very important. And then one of the rituals would be to salt each other's food. So I would salt their food, they would salt my food, and it was like signing a contract. You'd eat together and you'd season each other's food. And there was a saying, we have salt between us. It was a wonderful saying. If you said, I have salt between this person, it meant that I trust them. Something good is going on between us. If there is salt between us, it means that we have an arrangement, an arrangement that I am confident in, an arrangement that I'm going to stick to, an arrangement that I can depend on. That was a wonderful phrase. If I were to say to my wife, we have salt between us, it means we have a commitment. My children, have a, we have salt between us. This congregation and myself, we have salt between us because you called me to be your pastor and I accepted, so we have salt between us. It's an arrangement, it's a covenant almost. So Jesus is certainly talking about us being enhanced. He's talking about us being flavoursome. He's also talking about us being open to what God does in us so that we can go along and say, there's salt between us. There's salt between God and myself. And this covenant that God has, it's not dependent upon us. We just saw today that there's salt between God and Sonny. Not because of anything that he can do, although he's very cute. If anybody was going to win God's favour for cuteness, it would be Sonny. This is why we're excited on a day like today because there's salt between Sonny and God simply because of what God is doing. Which means for us, the relationship that we've got with God, the salt that we have between God and us is not dependent upon what we do, but everything to do with what God has to do. Sometimes we get this misunderstanding of Christianity that to have a good relationship with God, we've got to be perfect, we've got to be moral, we've got to be ethical, we've got to be all these good things. Otherwise, God's not interested. But that's not true. It's what God does that's important. If we try to be better, if we try to be more tasty, like my dad put in the, the salt on the tomatoes, we can't salt ourselves. We can't become better people so that we can be more like God in our own strength. In fact, God says, don't worry about that. What God says is, I'm only interested in your heart. How's your heart? God wants to know how our heart is. Is our heart broken? Is it sad? Are we hopeful? Are we optimistic? How are we seeing life? How are we doing in our heart, in our soul? That's what God's interested in. God is not worried too much about what we did yesterday and what we're going to do tomorrow. He's worried about how is our heart. And when he wants to have salt with us, it means he wants to look into our heart. He wants us to be honest with him and open with him so that he can be active. Rosalie quite rightly said that God gives us grace and joy and love. But if we are not open to those things, and if we think, oh, look, I can do these certain things and get them myself, then we're locking God out. And what he says to us is straightforward. I want to have salt with you. Will you let me salt you? Are you open to it? Because so often, we'll listen to anybody else but God. So often when there's something happening in our lives, the first person we go to is Dr. Google. 
I personally think that Dr. Google's got a lot to answer for. Sometimes I can get a pain in my leg or something and I go straight to Dr. Google and I run out to Connie, I've got cancer! <laughs> and she says, you haven't got cancer. If I want to know something about, oh, how can I feel better in this situation? I go to Google and I get the top 20 pages recommended by Google. It's really easy for us to access information about how we can do well in life. It's really easy for us to access information about if I'm feeling down, if I'm feeling low, if I'm not achieving what God wants me to achieve, I can just go to Google. How's that working out? Well, we know it doesn't work out. We know that unless we are open to the action of God, we're not going anywhere. In our own strength, we are unable. But in God's strength, we are able. And the amazing thing is that when we are open to God being at work, that starts to impact other people. You know, it's impossible if you have a relationship with somebody not to be influenced by them. It's impossible. If you're close to somebody, they affect you. You affect them. If there's a relationship where you are not affecting each other, not much of a relationship. There's lots of these um, gurus who say the secret to success, the secret to a happy life, and one of the things they say is to surround yourself with positive, exciting people. And the rationale is this or the theory is this. Who we are is the average of the five people that we are closest with. Now, I don't know if that's a formula, but I know there's truth in it. I know there's a lot of truth in that. And if you ever doubted that, come and work in a high school and watch somebody go from year seven to year nine. There's no question that the people that we hang out with, the people that we're in relationship with, affect us. Now, God says to us, because you are my people and because we have salt and because I am giving you hope and peace, what I'm asking you to do is, when you're in that situation, you to be agents of that peace, to be agents of light and agents of grace. We can only do that when we are open to what God's doing. But if we are, what we find is his action is remarkable, is transformative. So that just as God says we have salt together, we can say to all those people that God has put in our path, we too have salt together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are so willing to be in our lives, that you are so willing to bless us, that you are willing to enhance our life by salting us, and that you want to have a covenant arrangement where we have salt together, where we can depend on your action. Lord, open our hearts so that we will be attuned to your action. Open us so that we will be welcoming you in our lives, that we, Lord, also can be salt and light to others. In your name we pray. Amen.